Hey everyone, Riley here with Dark Arrow. We have the whole Dark Arrow 1 prototype assembled because we're installing the control system. The controls are flight critical, so naturally we want to get everything right there. There's a couple of challenges that we're facing, the biggest one being tight packaging. There's a lot that we're trying to fit in this small airframe, and it's going to be hard to see the control system with everything installed, so we're going to be using the CAD model to talk through the controls. The split rudder is a unique feature to our design, and we want to show you that. We also have a cool material that we're using to accomplish balance on the control surfaces to prevent flutter. Let's just jump right into it. We'll start our discussion on the control system by talking through the primary flight control surfaces. I've got the plane behind me and then our wind tunnel model and I'll use those to explain the control surfaces which are a movable portion at the trailing edges of the wings, horizontal stabilizer, and vertical stabilizer. And I've marked those out uh, with colored tape on my little wind tunnel model. When we're flying through the air, we want to be able to control the aircraft on three axes, pitch, roll, and yaw. And that's accomplished with the control surfaces. When we want to pitch the nose up and down, we use the elevators to do that. Those are marked in yellow here on the trailing edge of the horizontal stabilizer. So as the elevators move up and down, they change the amount of lift or downforce on the horizontal stabilizer, which pitches the nose up and down. Keegan's in the airplane. He's going to be flying the airplane for us. He's going to move the control surfaces to show what this looks like on the actual aircraft. So Keegan, why don't you point the nose up? He'll pull back on the stick, which moves the elevators up. That creates a downforce on the tail, so that pitches the nose up. Now, if he were to try to point the nose down, it'd be the opposite direction. He'd push forward on the stick, that moves the elevators down, and that creates a lift force on the horizontal stabilizer, and that pitches the nose down like this. So that's pitch control. Roll control is accomplished with our ailerons. Those are at the tips of the wings, and they move in opposite directions compared to elevators move both together, ailerons are moving opposite. So if the right aileron moved up, the left aileron move down. So Keegan's going to do that on the actual aircraft. So Keegan, why don't you turn the airplane like that? Okay. So this would be a turn to the right. Right aileron moving up produces a downforce on the right wing. Left aileron moving down produces a lift force on the left wing. And that's going to bank the airplane to the right like this. So if you're going to turn the opposite direction, opposite would be true. So now we've got the left aileron up, right aileron down. That's producing a downforce on, on the left wing tip an up force on the right wing tip, and that's going to bank the airplane or roll it to the left. That's roll control. The last axis, yawing the aircraft or giving directional control about the vertical axis is accomplished with the rudders. I've marked that out in blue on our little wind tunnel model. Traditionally, we just have a single rudder that points left and right to yaw the aircraft nose left and right. As the rudder deflects, that changes the amount of lift force on the vertical stabilizer, but the lift vector is pointed to the side, and that's what makes the nose yaw or point left and right for yaw control. Our airplane's a little bit different. We actually have two rudders. We have a split rudder design, so we've got a left and right rudder, and they deflect independently. So Keegan, why don't you show what that looks like? We'll do a left turn deflecting the left rudder. That's going to create uh, a lift force sideways on the tail and yaw the nose to the left. Opposite rudder deflecting the right rudder is going to yaw the airplane to the right like this. The last piece of functionality with the split rudder is we have speed brake. So if we deflect both rudders at the same time out like this, that creates a lot of drag to slow the airplane down. So we use that speed brake functionality to slow the airplane from uh, high speed cruise down to traffic pattern speeds, or if we're trying to descend from altitude without picking up a lot of airspeed, we could use the speed brake for that. So those are the control surfaces. You've seen them move on the actual aircraft, but how is Keegan moving those control surfaces from the cabin? Obviously he's moving the stick and the rudder pedals to get them to deflect, but what's the mechanism that translates his motion from his hands and feet? into the control surfaces. We'll take a look at that. We've got a bunch of torque tubes and linkages that make this happen. We'll look at the CAD because you can't see it all with everything assembled. So let's jump into the CAD environment. I have the Onshape CAD model, the darker one prototype here. And I have the airframe shown sort of transparent or ghosted out so that we can see the internal hardware that connects the control sticks to the control surfaces themselves to give us motion in the control system. We'll talk through the elevators first since I have those animating right now. You can see our control sticks moving forward and aft and then the elevator moving up and down to give us pitch control. So the way the sticks are coupled to the elevators, we have a push rod connected to each stick grip and those are tucked away in the armrests. And then the pilot and co-pilot controls are ganged together through a torque tube that sits just behind the seat back. And that runs 
uh, laterally in the airplane. So that couples the pilot and co-pilot controls together. Running aft from there, we have a mid push rod, and then that's connected to a bell crank right next to our pitch autopilot servo. We'll save that for a different video. And then running aft from there, there's a aft elevator push rod that's directly connected to the elevator. So you can see all those move together to give us pitch control. And that system's pretty straightforward to visualize. The ailerons on the other hand are a little bit more tricky. You can see the ailerons moving up and down, but they're moving opposite relative to each other to give ourselves roll control. So the way we're translating motion from stick to the aileron is a little bit more tricky. We're involved now. We have torque tubes that run from the root of the aileron to the root of the wing. And then in the armrests, we have a torque tube that each stick is mounted to. So as you move the sticks left and right, that spins this torque tube. And then that torque tube is connected with a link to the torque tube in the root of the wing. I don't have all the hardware in here, the nuts and bolts, don't worry about that. We're just trying to simulate the basic motion of all these links and torque tubes. So you can imagine this setup would be more difficult to visualize. We're just trying to design this in our heads or if even we're gonna do a 2D sketch and that's where the Onshape motion simulation comes in really handy. And Onshape's actually the sponsor of this video. Onshape's been our CAD tool of choice for the Dark Arrow One and it's come in really handy in uh, situations like this where there's 3D motion and it's difficult to visualize or you might have hardware that's interfering with other components. Uh, so this allows us to check for interferences and just understand what's going on. We actually made a couple changes to the design based on this assembly we built with motion simulation. So if you want to give Onshape a try for free, you can check out the link in the description of this video. The last piece of the control system that we need to talk through is the rudders. The rudders are actuated through the rudder pedals. So you have pilot and co-pilot rudder pedals that sit up by your feet and they're ganged together with torque tubes. So as the left pedal moves, uh, that happens the same on co-pilot and pilot controls. Same thing with the right pedals, those move together. And the mechanism to translate the motion in the pedals to the rudders themselves is pretty simple. For this control setup, we just have cables. I've got the cables shown here and they're directly coupled between the pedals and the rudders. So as you move the left pedal, left rudder moves. As you move the right pedal, right rudder moves and they can move together to give speed brake functionality or deploy both rudders at the same time. So the rudders are independent of each other. And we've had some comments about, oh, maybe this is tricky to learn or is this hard to manipulate? But it's the exact same setup as you see in Rutan style canard aircraft, like the very easy and long easy where they have two vertical stabilizers and two rudders. Those are actuated independently, the exact same on those aircraft and there's thousands of those flying. So it's a pretty proven setup. We just took that system and adopted it for a conventional configuration aircraft with a single vertical stabilizer and two rudders. Should be an easy system for Dark Arrow 1 pilots to learn. So that's the control system for the Dark Arrow 1, or at least the internals in the CAD model for that. Let's jump back out to the prototype to take a look at the physical hardware. So we saw the control surfaces moving, and we also saw in the CAD model the hardware and mechanisms that make these move. And that all looks pretty good, but that's not all we need to make an airworthy control system. So what else is important? We want to have a low amount of friction in the system. We don't want to be fighting friction in the bearings between the control stick and the control surface when we're flying the airplane. So low friction is important. We also want to have a low amount of free play or backlash between the control stick and the control surface. When you saw everything moving in the CAD model, it was moving with perfect precision, but the real world's kind of messy. So all the hardware and linkages and bearings has a little bit of clearance between the parts as they fit up, and that's just so things can fit together, but that also creates backlash the system. Backlash means I would basically have a little bit of dead band or wiggle in the control system that doesn't correspond to a one-to-one -one motion in the control surface. The other area that could come from is compliance or lack of stiffness in the brackets that support the control system hardware. So you can think about all the linkages and brackets as a system of springs and they give a little bit when you input force into the system. So it's important for the system to be stiff. Balance of the control surfaces is also important and that's to reduce the likelihood of flutter. We did a whole video about flutter or air elasticity but that was mainly about the structures in the airplane. The control surfaces themselves could also flutter or flap like a flag in the breeze. So there's a couple ways you reduce the likelihood of that. First off, you want to build the control surfaces light and stiff. And then beyond that, you mass balance them about the control surface hinge line. And that's what these arms are for. These have mass forward of the hinge line so that 
the control surfaces balance about the hinge point. If you've been following this project and know anything about the Dark Arrow 1, you know we hate adding mass to the airplane, so this mass balance thing is something we want to do really efficiently. One way to do that might be making this arm really long so that we're adding only a small amount of mass to generate enough moment to balance out the center of gravity of the control surface. But there's a limit on how long we can make this arm because at some point it starts to interfere with the aerodynamics. So we actually want to keep it pretty short and compact to keep it streamlined and aerodynamic. So there's a limit on the length of this arm. That means that we have to use a material that's pretty dense. So we're packing as much material as possible at the forward end of this arm. And we use tungsten to accomplish that goal. Tungsten is really high density, but also still readily available. We could have used lead or steel, but they're not quite as dense as tungsten. So tungsten minimizes the total amount of weight that we're actually adding to this arm. An even better approach that's gonna minimize the mass that you're adding is to build a control surface light in the first place. Every gram that you have after the hinge line is another gram that you have to add forward to the hinge line. So building the control surface as light as possible is gonna do a double hit as far as weight reduction. We used carbon fiber for the control surfaces because it's light, but it's also stiff. Stiffness is also important for reducing flutter. Maybe you have a project of your own that has some challenging requirements for weight reduction and stiffness. If you wanna learn about using carbon fiber, we actually teach courses on it. You can check out our website to learn more about that. Serviceability is also important for the control system. You can maybe argue that that's not flight critical, but we think it is because the more difficult it is to work on your control system, System, the less likely it is you're gonna go in and take things apart and correct things that need to be fixed that you learn in flight testing. So we think serviceability is pretty important. We have the basic functionality of the control system complete, but we're still refining the friction, the free play, and the stiffness of the system. And we're also adding in the secondary flight controls, which are the trim tabs and the flaps. And we have an upcoming video talking about all that. We'll leave it here for now in this video. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one.